Hi everyone, and welcome to our overview of Chapter 7, Equal Protection of the Laws. Fundamental fairness requires equal treatment of all persons in equal circumstances. If persons are in circumstances that are different in relevant ways, however, fundamental fairness may allow or even require differential treatment. For example, a student's race or gender is irrelevant to the student's right to educational opportunity. All students have the same legal right to educational opportunity regardless of their race or gender. There is no relevant or permissible connection between these factors and the right to educational opportunity. A student's disability, however, may legitimately affect the scope of the student's right to educational opportunity. Children with disabilities may have special needs requiring educational opportunities and support beyond those generally available to non-disabled children. Or a student's criminal acts or a significant breach of school rules uh, may also result or re even require differential treatment, resulting in a loss of educational opportunities through lawful suspension or expulsion. Equal protection of the laws prohibits differential treatment based on factors that are legally irrelevant and are instead the products of irrational prejudice or discrimination, but may allow or even require differential treatment when there are legally relevant differences among individuals. The ideals of fundamental human equality and equal treatment under the law are essential to just and rational governance. Irrational discrimination in governance, however, has historically been driven by ignorance, fear, and hatred. Ignorance is the foundation of fear, and fear is the fuel of hatred. When rational thought collides with, with such powerful negative emotions, too often irrational emotionalism prevails. For these reasons, realizing the ideals of the Equal Protection Clause have been a painfully protracted process in the United States. In 1776, the U.S. Declaration of Independence declared, all men are created equal, but the achievement of that ideal remains an ongoing challenge. The legacy of race-based slavery, for example, that divided the United States since its founding, is a stark example of the vast distance that too often exists between the ideals of equality and the actual circumstances of citizens denied equal protection under the laws because of irrational discrimination. <clears throat> These bitter disputes over slavery, rights of citizenship, and the balance between federal and state powers exploded in the U.S. Civil War in 1861. After the Civil War, the 14th Amendment was proposed by Congress in 1866 and ratified by the states in, in 1868. As ratified, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment declared, no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Since its adoption, the 14th Amendment has been transforming the U.S. by creating a legal basis for challenging unequal treatment by government officials in a court of law, and thereby pushing society towards greater equality under the law. <clears throat> to withstand equal protection scrutiny, government officials must prove that there is a sufficient link between the basis for the differential treatment by government and an appropriate government objective. As discussed in previous chapters, courts develop legal tests to guide judges in interpreting the law and to guide everyone else in legal compliance. In interpreting the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, the U.S. Supreme Court developed a multi-tiered approach for adjudicating allegations of governmental denial of equal protection of the laws. Where differential treatment by government is established by plaintiffs, the purpose of the court's inquiry is to determine whether the differential treatment is justified by a sufficient governmental interest. The graduated levels of scrutiny reflect the court's determination that certain categories of government action, such as discrimination based on race, national origin, or a fundamental right, are inherently more suspect than others, such as general social and economic regulations, and therefore merit heightened levels of judicial scrutiny and require greater, le greater levels of proof by government officials seeking to defend the differential treatment. <clears throat> Concerning the Equal Protection Test, the Court has recognized three basic levels of judicial scrutiny based on how suspect the government's differential treatment is, low-level, intermediate, and high-level judicial scrutiny. Concerning when low-level judicial scrutiny is appropriate, Members of the legislative and administrative branches are elected to make decisions about general social and economic issues. 
The judicial branch is not a general overseer of all government decisions. Therefore, courts should defer to the political branches concerning general social and economic issues and only intervene when clearly warranted because of irrational governmental discrimination. Under the court's interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause, differential treatments based on general social and economic regulations, for example, tax rates, zoning regulations, etc., are only subjected to the low-level scrutiny of the rational basis test. Under the rational basis test, government officials need only establish that, their, establish that their actions are rationally related to a legitimate governmental interest. Whether legislative and administrative decisions on general social and economic issues are unwise is for voters to decide in subsequent elections. It is only when these actions discriminate without any rational basis that judicial intervention is warranted. <clears throat> Government actions that discriminate based on gender, age, or legitimacy have been considered quasi-suspect by the court and subjected to an intermediate level of scrutiny. Differential treatment based on these quasi-suspect criteria is deemed unconstitutional under the Equal Protection Clause unless government officials can prove that the differential treatment was substantially related to an important gov governmental interest. However, since the court's decision in U.S. v. Virginia, the VMI case, the court has applied a further elevated scrutiny to differential treatment based on gender, requiring that differential treatment based on gender be justified by an exceedingly persuasive justification. Differential treatment based on fundamental rights or suspect classifications, such as race and national origin, are subjected to the strictest judicial scrutiny. To qualify as a suspect classification, the court has held that the government action must be aimed at a discrete and insular minority that is, one, politically powerless, and two, historically discriminated against. <clears throat> to be politically powerless doesn't mean the group has no political power, but instead they have no realistic opportunity to defend themselves against majoritarian power in the common legislative realm. Women, for example, have not been deemed a suspect class because in the U.S. voting-aged women outnumber voting-aged men, making it politically possible for women to defend their rights in the legislative realm or even to dominate the political process. Men are not a suspect class, however, because there is no substantial legislative history of discrimination against men in the U.S. Therefore, the court treats gender discrimination as a quasi-suspect class, subject to an elevated standard of review but not subject to strict scrutiny. Racial discrimination, however, has been so pervasive that the court subjects any governmental use of race or ethnicity to strict scrutiny. All suspect classifications are subject to strict scrutiny and must be justified by establishing that the differential treatment is necessary to a compelling governmental interest and narrowly tailored to achieving that interest. In practice, Governmental actions subjected to strict judicial scrutiny rarely, survi rarely survive this rigorous judicial test. Justice Marshall recognized that strict scrutiny is generally strict in theory but fatal in fact. Under the court's sharply divided, uh, I'm sorry, until the court's sharply divided 5-4 decision in Grutter v. Bollinger in 2003, the last time a government racial classification survived strict, strict scrutiny by the court was in Korematsu v. U.S in 1944, the now universally condemned case in which the court upheld forced relocations and internments of Japanese Americans. The core teaching of the court's cases on equal protection is that government officials cannot legally treat individuals differently for irrelevant, discriminatory reasons, such as the person's race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, etc., when those factors do not bear an appropriate relationship to a sufficient governmental justification. Absent a legitimate and sufficient reason for differential treatment, federal, state, and local governments must treat all persons equally under the laws. The 14th Amendment also grants Congress the power to enforce the 14th Amendment through appropriate legislation, legislation which includes, for example, the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and subsequent legislation prohibiting discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, and disability. <clears throat> in Chapter 7, we will, we will review the U.S. Supreme Court's decisions in Plessy v. Ferguson, Brown v. Board of Education, and other leading equal protection cases. 
We will also study the laws governing discrimination based on national origin and immigration status, discrimination based on language, rights to English instruction, discrimination based on gender, separate gender educa education, athletic opportunities for students, marital or parental status of students, sexual harassment under Title IX, challenges to inequalities in school funding, and challenges, challenges to school fees. In summary, the Equal Protection Clause was intended to abolish systems of social caste in the U.S. Generally, government officials must provide equal treatment to individuals in equal circumstances. Differ differential treatment must be justified by proving an appropriate relationship between the differential treatment and a sufficient governmental justification. Equal protection of the laws prohibits differential treatment based on factors that are legally irrelevant, for example, race, color, national origin, etc., and are instead the products of irrational prejudice or discrimination. But differential treatment may be allowed or even required when, they are, when, when there are legally relevant differences among individuals. The U.S. Supreme Court has developed a multi-tiered test for reviewing equal protection claims. Where differential treatment by government is established by plaintiffs, the court reviews whether the differential treatment is justified by a sufficient governmental interest. Concerning high level or strict scrutiny, the differential treatment must be necessary to a compelling interest and narrowly tailored to achieving that interest. Concerning intermediate level scrutiny, differential treatment must be substantially related to an important governmental interest. Concerning low level or rational basis test scrutiny, Government officials need only show that the differential treatment is rationally related to a legitimate governmental interest. Strict scrutiny applies to differential treatment based on suspect classifications or fundamental rights, and the rational basis test applies to general social or economic regulations. Government officials almost always lose under strict scrutiny, while plaintiffs nearly always lose under the rational basis test. Since the VMI test, differential treatment based on gender has been subjected to elevated scrutiny, higher than intermediate level scrutiny, but less than strict scrutiny. While not treated as equivalent to race discrimination, gender discrimination requires an exceedingly persuasive justification. The core teaching of the court's cases on equal protection is that government officials cannot legally treat individuals differently for irrelevant discriminatory reasons such as the person's race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, etc. when those factors bear no appropriate relationship to a sufficient governmental justification. In conclusion, regarding equal protection of the laws, treat everyone fairly and be diligent in assuring, in assuring that prejudice conscious or unconscious, plays no role in the treatment of individuals. Unless there is a sufficient justification for differential treatment, all persons in similar circumstances should be treated equally. I hope you will enjoy your studies, and very best wishes to all.